Hi, my name is Simon Bennett. I'm the OSAP founder and project lead. And this is a series of training events about SAP that I'm giving to the folks here at StackOrc. And today we're uh, going through WebSockets. So for those of you who don't know, WebSockets is an HTML5 feature. It is full duplex communication. So once the channel's been opened, then either side, either the browser or the server can send information. We're, we're not waiting for a kind of, there's not the request and response that you get with HTML. Either side can send as many messages as it wants, whenever it wants. Uh, so one problem with WebSockets is that um, the structure is text really. So there's no structure at all. So it, different applications might use JSON, XML, comma separated variable, or custom um, structures, which is which are actually very common, or that seem to be ones we come across most. Uh, so Zap was one of the very first security tools to support WebSockets, and I believe it's still got one of the best support. Um, so it includes all the commercial security tools as well. I think Zap still has the best, or one of the best, if not the best support for WebSockets. So let's have a look at it. And for that, I will share my screen. So this is, so I'm going to demo, um, obviously, with Zap 2.10 as usual. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a site which is called websocket.org. So and this site can sometimes um, take a little while, so it'll take a little while to load. But if we have a look here, we'll see that we're getting a load of um, HTTP requests as usual, and we're seeing things in the site stream. Hopefully it went too long, take too long. It's starting to get there. I said sometimes this site can take a little while to, to load, and I don't think that, that doesn't seem to be Zap's problem. It seems to be a fairly slow site, but it's just for tech, um, testing web sockets, so it's kind of useful to use. So you can see we're yep, loading things, and it's nearly there. We can actually see stuff. And great, the browser supports web sockets. So normally, uh, most sites would automatically set up a uh, WebSocket connection when they want to use it. In this case, it's a test site, so you've got to manually connect. So what I'll do, I said this might take a little while, but I will connect and then try and send a WebSocket message. And it's connected and sent. And what you may have noticed is in Zap, we actually switched over and we got a new WebSocket tab. So this will appear um, the first time when you start Zap and uh, when WebSocket messages start happening. So if you actually close it, and then it won't reopen by automatic, I don't think. So what we'll see is we can see uh, the channels. So we can see all of the channels that are available, and we can see all of the messages. And if you select any one of those, then you'll see the message, and you can see it's pretty unstructured. So. As usual with Zap, we have loads, well, quite a few right-click options. So if you right-click on a message, we'll see we've got open, resend, and hopefully I can resend it with Zap. And that didn't appear to do anything, but if we go over to the browser, we will see, so this is a message on the, this is just a pane on the browser where we can see the WebSocket messages. And you can see we actually sent one from, um, from this page and received it. In this case, we received one without sending it. So we actually sent a new message, WebSocket message from Zap. So one thing you can do, so you'll see all of the different channels here. There's only one at the moment. And you can see this one is actually connected um, because the two plugs are together. If this gets disconnected, then they will separate. And if you select a particular channel, then you can actually see the handshake. So what happens with WebSockets is there is an HTTP request, and it's the request is to upgrade to WebSockets. So you can actually see that request if you select a channel and then show the handshake. Now, what we can also do is in this panel, we can filter things. So we've got a lot of messages going on. You can show whatever you want. So we can filter by the different op codes. So WebSocket supports text binary. There's a close and these pings and pongs that you've seen down here. Um, we can filter on outgoing or incoming messages, the payload patterns. So I'll put zap in there and apply, and we'll see we just get the 
the, the message with zapping. So that helps you filter, um, find the things you want. So one of the other things we support in Zap, um, as it's intercepting proxy, one of the standard things you often want to do if you're doing manual pen testing is change HTTP messages on the fly. And we can actually do that with web sockets as well. I'll just check what options I have. Okay, we've got it enabled on all breakpoints. I'll go through those in a minute. So what happens with um, normally, so if you want to break on everything, there's this option here, set breakpoints on all requests and responses. So I'll enable that and try and send something. And we will see, we actually get switched over back automatically back to here. See, so I'll get with zap again. And in this case, I will submit and continue. And what we should see is we actually received this rocket with, so we actually sent um, rocket with HTML5. We intercepted it on the fly and changed it to rocket with zap again. Now, if you actually put um, a global breakpoint on, then you will um, get, you'll intercept all of the HTTP requests, all the web sockets. So, you know, it could be a load of things going on that you don't want to see. So we actually have, um, we have custom breakpoints and you can see them, actually dialogue, for some reason gets, needs to be scaled properly. So you can actually create them uh, manually or you can create them, you can actually right click and based on, you can, based on that, you can choose to break on text. So what we'll do is actually just break on zap and I need to sort this dialogue out. So I've actually um, zoomed in using one of the zap controls um, and some a couple of dialogues don't like it very much, including this one. So we now see we've got this new breakpoints tab and we've got breaking on web sockets and the payload zap. So if I just send the web socket message again, nothing will happen. But if I put zap in there, then it will get intercepted. And now if I send that, it will we'll get it again because that was on going out. So I can just keep on, so I don't need to send that again, change it again. And you'll see we, you know, we intercepted the um, rocket with zap and then we intercepted the rocket with that zap intercepted that we changed on the first time. So this means you've actually got a quite fine grain control over very fine grain control of, over what you actually intercept and change on the fly. So one of the other things we can do, um, so one of the things I showed recently was fuzzing. So let's have another look at one of these requests. And um, hopefully you remember, if you had, did watch the fuzzing session, all you had to do was you had to, with HTTP messages, you selected part of a message and then clicked, right clicked and fuzz. And we've got the same option here on WebSockets. So again, We've already selected that particular location, the message. Then we want to select payloads. And in this case, I'm going to go for file fuzzers, jbro fuzz, and cross-site scripting. You can see a whole load of um, different cross-site scripting attacks here. And OK that, and I'll start the fuzzer. And there you can see, we actually went down and you can see all the requests. And if we go to the browser, we will actually see all of the requests, all of the attacks that were made. So Zap was able to fuzz um, web sockets, send a whole load of attacks, and they were received, and none of them actually escaped out of, um, so none of them were successful, which is good for this site, really. Uh, but it does show you, you can just basically attack whatever element of a web socket message that you want. Now we'll have a look, show you some of the options we have with web sockets. Uh, remember that you can go to the options at the top on the um, toolbar here, but if any of the uh, tabs have their own gear icon, then that will take you straight to the right option. Of course, this one's the fuzzer, which I didn't mean to show you. Um, so go to WebSockets, and again, that's got that. So we have various options. So one option is to actually forward all WebSocket communication. Uh, in this case, if you select that, you will not see WebSockets in Zap. Um, so in the UI or in storage. Now you might want to do that if you're not, if you don't want to actually test the web sockets and you've got a site that makes heavy use of them. So if you've got something like a game 
Um, there might be loads of web sockets going on. They might actually slug your application quite a bit. They're going through Zap. We've got an option to break on um, it if uh, break is enabled on the all request response break buttons. Uh, that's the one up here. So you can turn that on on and off, and you've got the option to break on ping and pong messages. Usually you don't want to. And by default, we will remove the um, sec web socket extensions header because otherwise um, Zap will have problems um, handling those messages. So I've shown you fuzzing, um, but there's more. So we have scripts. So if we have a look at the scripts, we actually have a set of scripts that are just for web sockets. So we have a um, web socket processor, uh, fuzzer web socket processor. Actually, if I show you the templates, it's probably more useful. So we've got examples in JavaScript and Groovy, I think that is. So if you have a look here, basically this is analogous to the HTTP message processor um, that was available for the fuzzer. Basically, you can process any message that you're fuzzing and do whatever you want with it. So you have full access to the message um, and you can, so remember we have processors for, um, for the payloads, um, but we have them for the whole message itself. And we've got the HTTP processors that I showed you before. So they're uh, manipulate, they allow you to manipulate the HTTP messages that you're fuzzing and the WebSocket ones, which allow you to manipulate the WebSocket messages that you're fuzzing. Then we have um, WebSocket sender scripts. So these get called on every WebSocket message. So these are very similar to the HTTP sender um, scripts that we have, but obviously, again, these are applying to WebSockets rather than HTTP messages. So if you want to change anything, uh, you can do that. Any any part of a WebSocket message, you can do that. And then we have WebSocket passive scan rules. So we have a set of passive scan rules on WebSockets. Now, these are kind of a little bit harder, you know, it's a bit harder to come up with passive scan rules uh, because, uh, because there's less structure in WebSockets. We don't know what to expect. What I'll do is I will send some example messages. So just cut and paste from another window. So I'm going to send that string there. And I'm going to go message from test at test.com. And obviously, they appear then in the WebSocket messages. But hopefully, they will also appear in alerts because we've got passive scan rules apply. So what you'll see is we have an alert now for personally identifiable identifiable information via web sockets and that's because that actually looks like a that looks like a a mastercard credit card number and if we go down we'll see an information message here email address found in web socket so you know clearly this is not necessarily a vulnerability which is why it's only info um, but that's why you know it's it's something you might be interested in. And I think it's in many cases, you know, okay, this is like debug um, error messages. So we actually look for a whole set of error messages, which could be very interesting. Um, and obviously, as these are scripts, you can change them on the fly. So what we've done is we've created these passive scan rules, which we think expose generally useful information that don't tend to be hard um, um, vulnerabilities because it's difficult to deduce whether hard vulnerabilities or not. The application error um, one probably has a lot of um, error messages that you probably do want to see. So if that flags something, then that's um, probably a, a definitely one you'd want to look into. But in general, they're kind of, you know, anything we think of that could be of interest. Obviously, if you think of anything else, then let us know um, and we can add them or you can send a um, pull request in as well um, to, to improve these scripts. Um, and obviously, as because they're scripts, you can change them. So you can change them in Zap, and you can change them for you know, your Zap instances that you run. So that is um, all of the Zap UI I was going to show. Anyone who's listening live, any questions about any of that so far? You didn't have to do any extra configuration for specifying the WebSocket Secure WSS. 
No, so that is, if you have a look at the options, um, so we removed the SEC WebSocket extensions header. Uh, because we're kind of man in the middling of uh, your browser and your um, server, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> and one of the things we want to do is remove that um, header because um, if that's in place, then that will cause us quite a few problems. Very useful. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so what I was going to do is actually show you the API quickly. So, so of course, you can just point your browser directly at Zap. And we scroll through the components, we'll see WebSockets. And WebSocket, that is. And so we've got some views and some actions. So you can list all of the channels. So you can see we've just got that one channel there at the moment. And you can actually look at individual messages. Um, so you can specify a specific message. You can list all of the messages. We can send text messages. We can't send binary messages at the moment. And you can set a breakpoint and then retrieve the break message as well. So with breaking, uh, we can't actually support breaking Oh, no, we can support it on, HT on HTTP, I forgot that. So yeah, basically we can support um, breaking on WebSockets and HTTP as well. So if you want to play, if you want to have a look at the, uh, understand the WebSockets APIs, then just have a play around with them. It's always a good, to, a good way to learn. Then for the code, um, this is all in Zap extensions. So we go into Zap extensions, add-ons, and scroll down to the bottom. We will see WebSocket and then dive into the source and you'll see it's quite a big add-on. There's a lot going on, um, but there's quite a lot to do. So if you want to dive into the source, then that is where you do it. And I will actually, while I remember, go back and we'll have a look at the community scripts. So this is where we've got a lot of the community scripts and hopefully the WebSocket passive scan scripts are. Okay, so we haven't got any in the, the um, community scripts there at the moment. Obviously, those, those are in the um, WebSocket add-on, WebSocket fuzz processor. No, we've just got the templates there. So if you come up with any um, WebSocket scripts that you think other people would like, then please share them with us um, and send a pull request into the community scripts. And that is everything I was going to cover in WebSockets. So those listening live, any questions? Obviously, if you're listening to this session after the event, then please just ask questions in the YouTube channel. Okay, thank you very much, and until next time.